Hey there, working preachers. This is Joy J. Moore. We want to extend a huge thank you to all who generously responded to this fall's campaign. We are happy to report that thanks to your generosity, we secured $10,000 in matching funds. Thank you. We know you rely on this site regularly, and we are grateful that you took time to let us know what this ministry is worth to you. Thank you for keeping Working Preacher working for you. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for the third Sunday of Advent, which falls on December 13, 2020, are from Isaiah chapter 61, 1 through 4, and 8 through 11, Psalm 126, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 24, and the Gospel of John, chapter 1, 6 through 8, and then 19 to 28. Big skip in uh, those verses because we have those three little verses about John the Baptist in the prologue, and then he really appears on the scene in, in John 19 through 28. So clearly this is about uh, John's witness and the importance of witness and testimony, uh, particularly in this gospel, but, but let's think about that in the context of Advent and what that means. And, uh, and that um, this, you know, this idea of, of witnessing uh, in the gospel of John, it's not just for the sake of, 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 of calling out what you've seen or articulating what you've observed. Uh, but as you move forward in the gospel of John, this, it is this witness, uh, this testimony as, uh, as, as John says, you know, look, behold, the Lamb of God that leads to relationship with Jesus, that leads to discipleship. So it's not witness in and of itself as it is what it, uh, what it points to, of course, points to Jesus, but then it's, um, it, it inherently is an invitation to something beyond that witness, something's supposed to happen in that witness. Uh, and I think that's, uh, I think that's an important distinction um, when we think about uh, what does what or testimony look like, um, at least at least how we get it in the Gospel of John. And it's it's one of the primary characteristics of discipleship in this gospel. Uh, it's it's uh, what we what we think about when we when we imagine, okay, what does discipleship look like? What do what does what kind of uh, characteristics does a disciple embody? And the primary category really in this gospel is witness. And so those will be some of the things that I would uh, that I would think about, and then how you could even you could even fast forward uh, in the gospel as to where you see that witness leading to uh, leading to relationship, and so the woman at the well witnesses, and it and it brings out her whole town, and so this is just not a theoretical reality, but really is for the sake of. Uh, it is for the sake of the entirety of the world being brought into relationship with God. It seems harder to bear witness these days. I think it's harder for communities to think about doing so because it's, it's hard to be out there in, in a communal way. Um, you know what I mean? One of the weird things is worship is so cut off now from others. It's harder for somebody maybe just to walk into your door but at the same time a lot of churches are reporting that you know children from the congregation who now live far away are are visiting online and um other people are just finding you on people who would not otherwise come into a, a sanctuary are joining online so it's it's different right but it's harder for churches to be out there some churches budgets have been cut which makes it harder to feel like they're contributing um, it's it's more difficult to be present in communities for a lot of ministers among just folks going about their business day in and day out. Does that does that change how we might hear this? Because so much of what how John's witness looks is so public in this gospel, and it's it's running into people. And 
I mean, we still have public lives and public witness, but doesn't it look different now? Or how would we deal with that? I hear what you're saying. I feel we're more public because anybody can drop in. Uh, there was a sense of um, boundaries um, because you knew when um, a newcomer or uh, it, it, or we would call them the stranger who wandered in our congregation when we were gathered. Um, but now uh, you don't know who's online. It feels much more public to me uh, if you look at it from, from that vantage point. Caroline, are you? Well, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think that's, um, I think that's in partly true, in part true. I, when, uh, when I was working on this text with some pastors a few weeks ago, the question I asked them to ask themselves and then um, as they thought about this with their congregation is, to what will your congregation point, uh, particularly at this time? And, and I think that pointing uh, does not necessarily have to be uh, as a, you know, as a, as a, kind of public nature, but in, I mean, as people are, as people are, like you said, Joy, dropping in, <laughs> in these, uh, in these Zoom formats or whatever, what will, you know, what will the witness of your congregation be? Uh, what will people, what will people learn about Jesus? What will people learn about God uh, in, what they, in what they experience in that worship service or in your preaching? And so I think that's, that's one way maybe I would answer that question too, Matt, is, uh, is, is it, bec it can become an a invitation to a kind of self-reflection of taking on taking on that role of witness and the importance of witness. And if we read for, forward a little bit, you don't have to include these verses in your preaching, but they're important for getting a sense of the importance of witness and what it looks like in, in John, that, in, uh, that even in, on, in verse 29, when Jesus first shows up in the gospel, besides the prologue, I mean, he's there in the prologue, but in terms of this public, uh, the public moment, uh, Jesus doesn't say a thing. It's John pointing to Jesus. And so, uh, so immediately the, that, that, that focus is on that importance of witness and testimony. So even though Jesus is in the room, <laughs> Jesus is silent uh, because that witness becomes so important that, that, uh, that, that John is pointing to this presence of, of Jesus in our midst. And so uh, that would be, those would be some things that I would invite um, some homiletical reflection on when it comes to this idea of witness, particularly now in our time when we can be, you know, at, at, or public maybe perhaps can be perceived differently. I appreciate that, Caroline. I was uh, with a congregation um, and uh, in a similar kind of, uh, they were, they were trying to recover the kind of actual ministries that they do. And uh, I actually made reference with them to say um, that, um, uh, that they had this opportunity to have all of these people that wouldn't walk through their doors or even be able to, you know, gather clothes from their uh, clothes co uh, closet or their food pantry. Um, but could hear, uh, as you so wonderfully put it, the pointing to Jesus. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and in a sense, we're reminded that um, uh, if, if we go farther, farther in, in John, that at the end, John's disciples are not going to remain committed to him because he's sending them to the one who has come. And that's the opportunity that congregations have now is through those who um, eavesdrop or drop in on, on their uh, virtual services um, to be pointed so to the God made known in Christ that when we are able to actually physically gather again, they would desire to find a community in their area that is talking about this God. Yeah, and I think I think that's important. And, you know, uh, uh, and, and claiming that identity 
And that's another thing, reading forward John 134, and I myself have seen and have testified that John claims that identity of, of witness for himself, even though we already know that he, from the prologue, that he's the one sent to witness, but then he claims that identity for himself. And there's something, I think that's something really powerful in, in claiming that identity. I think the other thing too is, uh, is, is it points, he, yeah, there's, there's that pointing to Jesus, look, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Uh, but really putting John's witness back in the prologue uh, to what John witnesses is the light shining in the darkness. And I think that can be another content of our witness uh, is that the light shines regardless of the darkness and, and, uh, and the darkness cannot overcome it. And, uh, and it's, it's really important, you know, there, in, in John scholarship, of course, in displacement theories, these verses were lifted out. They don't belong here. What is John doing in the middle of this cosmic birth story? You know, this pro, this, this beautiful prologue, and then John plops in. And but I think that's a really important theological claim that you have this 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 real live John. <laughs> testifying or, or giving testimony to what is um, going about to become temporal. And so you have, and what's now going to be incarnational. And so that lends a kind of, I think, content to the witness that is not just pointing to Jesus, but it is, uh, it is making that claim of the light shining and that this is uh, this is um, God entering into humanity. And so those, those would be um, some other things maybe that you could, uh, directions you could point, haha, <laughs> get it, in your, in your sermon. That issue of particularity is so important and like kind of the groundedness of John because I think it was our friend uh, Carol Miles who used to say that at Christmas and Easter, the church makes its most outrageous claims. And these are the times when people are most likely to, to stumble in or only come twice a year. But but this is where the scandal happens. And so during a time when we might be tempted to talk about incarnation and all of its jo Johannine prologue glory, right? And all of its trans historical, and you know, let me, let me take you back to creation. None of that information is useful to most people's lives unless it's grounded in somebody who can bear witness to that. And, and the fact that it's somebody kind of as scraggly or as unpopular or as strangely popular or as controversial as a guy like John is worth remembering every advent, which is why John gets his time in the in the spotlight every advent. But you know what I mean? That it's the, the church can talk incarnation and can talk big language about righteousness and and exposing the you know the the lies of this world. But unless we see it lived out, or unless somebody bears witness to it, who's one of us and and flesh and blood and even maybe a little weird it just doesn't sink i think for most of us and so i, I like how you mentioned that the importance of john being mentioned in the midst of that that grandiose poetry mm -hmm. i love that and that's the last verse there this took place this took place in a specific place across the Jordan where something specific was happening, where John was baptizing. Um, you, just, you just gave me a new title for that section because I would, I would take that particular entry into it and I would call it, this took place because of that double entendre about, you know, it's not just some, um, uh, to use the word that uh, Ralph spoke about last week, some poetic idea out there it's on the ground right here and now. It happened right here. Love it. Isaiah 61. How, how weird it is to um, be facing up with Isaiah 61 and not, uh, not pairing it with something from the Gospel of Luke, but from the Gospel of John. You know, that is, uh, this is the passage uh, Jesus uh, <clears throat> uh, reads from his, uh, you, you always have to call it his inaugural sermon. I don't know why it's inaugural, but uh, I mean, I do know why in, a, in Luke 4. But um, here, um, 
the the verse that jumps out at me um, in this context is verse three and following to provide for those who mourn in glory that the spirit of God here um, is anointing a preacher to provide for those who mourn. Uh, and then notice the poetry. Um, that is those who mourn, what do they do? They, they, uh, they bedeck themselves. Uh, uh, that's, a, that's an oddly curious phrase, bedeck themselves, sorry. They, they would put ashes on themselves uh, and in their mourning, they would have a faint spirit. So in place of ashes and mourning and uh, faintness, a garland, the oil of gladness and a mantle of praise. Uh, that is the transformation of everything that goes with mourning and repentance and sadness. Uh, that the preacher here is anointed with God's spirit in order to change the sort of reality of people and then more poetry. So there'll be oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord and they will build up the ancient ruins. They, the they of course is those who have been mourning. Um, again, in this context, in our context, in this uh, crappiest of all years, uh, 2020, um, to imagine that uh, the preacher would have something that could, something to say that could change all that into such wonderful, uh, change all the, junk that goes with mourning with a, a, a terrible year and that the preacher would have something to say. And of course, the only thing there is to say is Jesus is Lord. And that one reality is the thing that changes everything. Uh, so, I mean, just recall, uh, even if you don't preach on this passage, working preachers, that, that this is uh, the incredible uh, calling of good news that that uh, your vocation is about. See, and I thought the passage was chosen because of the reference to Garland. And, uh, and I've heard that a number of people are decorating early this year for Christmas. And so I thought that was the logical uh, well, reason Matt's, for this. Matt's got this. his little tree up in his office. I had three candles lit, but one of them has, uh, gone out uh, for the third sentiment. You've got gifts in the background, right? We're decorating early. I got on yep. purple. Yeah, purple. <laughs> <laughs> it is it's purple day, purple day in the podcasting. It is. <laughs> At least for us. We got the memo. Yeah. yeah, well, it's also the Sunday, the third Sunday in Advent, you know, Gaudete Taste Sunday is typically oh, okay. about joy. Stop. Gaudete Sunday. I, I knew Matt was going to come with that. Our so, liturgical yeah. ex expert. Well, so the focus is typically on joy in a lot of traditions uh, for this Sunday. But this is also the year when, you know, when those blue Christmas services might not be held on Wednesday nights, but instead might get moved to Sunday morning in some congregations where people are... Um, are delaying their funerals or delaying expressions of grief and ritual. They're first time not seeing extended family for the holidays, maybe ever and for some households that there might be a, there might be good reason to, again, to move that, that addressing of holiday grief a little bit more uh, prominently than, than we usually do, right? Those are usually kind of niche services that you hold and, you know, people who want to come can come, uh, or at least to express it, at least to just name the um, well, the sadness and the, the suffering that a lot of communities are still stuck in. But then also, uh, maybe this is where the psalm can come in. Uh, that may those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. We have the same themes here of uh, those who go out weeping shall come home with shouts of joy. And so that, that reality of we might not be able to quite get to the joy yet. Uh, but, uh, but I think the Psalm helps us with what you're saying, Matt, that the, of that naming of the, of the weeping and the naming of the, of the tears and, uh, and yet, uh, maybe putting, you know, putting into conversation those, that last verse of the, of the Pericope and Isaiah 
as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up. So the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all nations. And then, and then here you have this uh, bearing the seed for sowing shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. And so uh, there could be, I think, a, a lovely connection uh, between those two passages to uh, maybe to get at uh, to to get at what you're talking about about the brokenhearted and and how yeah. and the oppressed and where that yeah. and the promise of the joy that can follow. And it's such a sensory psalm, right? Laughter, shouts, uh, wa water that it courses through a dry riverbed. You know, bringing in a harvest and you know something else I'm going to miss about the holidays, right? smells and noises and, and things like that. But it is, it's such a participatory psalm because it, it pulls me in to imagine real Dream. experiences, real restorate, restorative experiences. Mm -hmm. And the linking uh, back with Isaiah, uh, uh, Caroline, you, you mentioned this um, as we were, were coming out of the gospel in terms of the light in the darkness which is precisely what, uh, for me, uh, the Isaiah text is naming um, uh, this uh, restoration of the Psalms, this year of jubilee, this promise of God is spoken to the oppressed, uh, to those who are brokenhearted, uh, to those who are captive. And Rolf mentioned how this is uh, um, the, um, the Luke, captures this is the sermon that the text that jesus preaches from and we're reading it while uh, we're in john but um i see the echoes in this passage here of the sermon of the mount you know uh, of those who are hungry and thirsting and and um uh what is it mourning that that was the word that um uh, ralph helped me land on and, and so that's the place where this restoration is most needed. And therefore, all of these um, tangible um, um, markers that the psalmist names is hitting folks at the tangible experience of their brokenness. Uh, this is such an incredibly dense, rich psalm. Um, and Notice how uh, it's, uh, it's assumed to be prayed from a situation of mourning, um, similar to Isaiah 61. So the, 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 the money verse is, restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses in the, the Negev of the desert. So that is the, the, the dry water beds, like in, in the rainy season, they run with water. Right now we're dry and restore us. And, but then going back to the first book, it's uh, the first verse, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, God has restored our fortunes before, you know, um, the, the, the song that comes to mind is, uh, you know, Oh, Mary, don't you weep, don't you cry. Uh, that always says, Pharaoh's armies got drowned. Uh, so remember, this isn't the first time that, uh, you know, in the, in the song, Mary, um, remember, this isn't the first time God has restored the fortunes of the people. So um, it, it, it kind of picks that up. Uh, so we are to remember in the middle of our winter of discontent that God has restored the fortunes of God's people before, and we ask God to do so again. And now I am singing that song. That is, I would not have thought about that there. Thank you for that. Yeah, I hope you have a we an earworm all day. I got the okay. Prince version. I got the Prince version going on with my purple <laughs> jacket. That. I got yeah. the Springsteen version. <laughs> Tell Martha not to moan. I, uh, I had said it. I had done the whole thing. Mary, don't you weep. <laughs> Tell Martha not to moan. Pharaoh's army 
Drowned in the Red Sea. Yeah, 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 you got it. The worm's there. And I hope I just gave it to everybody else. That's a different song than the one I know. It's, uh, but anyway, I won't sing. But uh, I like that version too. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks. Guess what I would do with First Thessalonians. I would well, use it as a three-point three sermon. Rejoice, pray, give thanks. So just oh, kidding. that's that's a good that's a good one. I like that one. Three points in a poem, uh, and that's a great idea. I would use it as the final blessing for the service. That's what I would do. Is I uh, use it liturgically or exhortation. Yeah, exhortation or whatever you want to call that final thing, dismissal. Uh, but I would use it. Yeah, I would definitely have it. Uh, be the last words that uh, people hear. Yeah, because song. verse 23 is then the benediction, right? May the God of peace sanctify yeah. you entirely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you do preach on this, make sure you summarize the entire book of First Thessalonians as well. I mean, honestly, that to point out, and, and Carla does this, Carla works does this in her commentary, that you have to point out that this is a letter where Paul is deeply concerned about a congregation that has undergone suffering, persecution that appears to have lost hope in certain ways. I mean, you don't have to talk about the entire letter, but just enough to say, and this is how it ends, you know, not with these admonitions of do better, try harder, but with this just deep encouragement, not just in the capacity of the Thessalonians to stay faithful, but also that God will remain faithful and that God will, um, will carry forth that promise about their sanctification um, and keeping them body, soul, and spirit. 